Live from wherever news is breaking, this is ABC Action News. Now it's six, a possible new victim and new threat against children from the serial sniper. A Bucks player is out of jail tonight after being accused of beating up his girlfriend. And a new development in the case of this missing Polk County baby. Good evening, I'm Marty Tucker. And I'm Brendan McLaughlin. It's our lead story tonight. A chilling threat from the serial sniper. A note left at the scene of Saturday's shooting warns parents, children are not safe anywhere at any time. Meanwhile, ballistics tests are underway right now to determine if a Maryland bus driver is the sniper's 13th victim. And as ABC's Lisa Sylvester shows us, authorities say no one is safe. We want to bring you the very latest information. Police Chief Charles Moosh just wrapped up a news conference, and he read from a letter that was written by the sniper. It says, your children are not safe anywhere at any time. Police also acknowledged receiving a second letter, and they are preparing their response. A chilling message from the sniper. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. That wording was part of a letter received at the Ponderosa restaurant over the weekend. 35-year-old Conrad Johnson, a county bus driver, was cleaning out his bus and finishing paperwork when he was shot in the abdomen around 6 in the morning. This latest shooting occurred near a wooded area of Montgomery County, Maryland, just half a mile from where the string of deadly snipings began more than two weeks ago. Investigators scoured the area for any small clue which could help them solve this case. If this is the work of the sniper, it's the 13th shooting and the 10th murder. No witnesses saw a getaway vehicle, but that didn't stop police from immediately setting up roadblocks, heavily armed officers checking all cars and vans. At this point, we have no vehicle lookout to share. We have no person look out to share. This shooting comes as police have been sending messages to the sniper through the media. Monday afternoon, the task force urged the sniper to call them back. In addition to at least one phone call from the sniper, investigators received a letter. ABC News has learned he demanded money and hinted there would be more attacks unless his demands were met. Police Chief Charles Moose said no one's safety is guaranteed. The person or the people involved in this have shown a clear willingness and ability to kill people of all ages, all races, all genders, all professions. Residents in the area are increasingly nervous. I can't go to school, you can't go outside, you can't do nothing, but in the ATF is out here, the FBI, the police, everybody's out here, but don't nobody know. Schools in Montgomery County, Maryland remain on lockdown. That means all outdoor activities and sports have been canceled. Lisa Sylvester, ABC News, Rockville, Maryland. Today's shooting victim, 35-year-old Conrad Johnson, was married, had two children. He had worked for Montgomery County, Maryland for 10 years. The sniper's 12th victim is reportedly from Melbourne, Florida. The man was shot in the stomach Saturday night outside a Ponderosa Steakhouse in Ashland, Virginia. The 37-year-old unidentified man is in critical but stable condition tonight. Doctors say he will have to undergo several surgeries to repair all the internal damage. A big development in the case of a missing 11-month-old Polk County baby. The ex-boyfriend, believed to be involved in the child's disappearance, has turned himself into police. Action News reporter Serena Fazan joins us now live from Bartow. And Serena, does Michael Lewis know where this child is? Well, Brendan, Michael Lewis maintains that the baby is with the child's mother. We want to point out that he came in with his attorney and he is not being held. He was allowed to leave. But we do have some late breaking news on this case. Just moments ago, we were told that a task force has been formed, including the FBI, FDLE, Bartow, and Lakeland Police. Also, we were told that dogs are searching near Michael Michael Lewis's apartment that is the last place Tania was seen. 17-year-old Miranda Jones claims her ex-boyfriend has her baby, but Michael Lewis's family alleges she is fabricating the story. There's no doubt in anyone's mind she has that baby. Miranda, they're saying that you're lying about this. Herb, are you a member of her family? Yes, I, am, I would appreciate you just leaving. Well, they're saying, ma'am, ma'am, they're saying that she's lying. Are you her mother? Who are you? Jones was at the Bartow police station today on her own. Detectives requested a meeting with 19-year-old Lewis. Detectives questioned Michael Lewis for about an hour, but he wasn't saying much. It was all through his attorney, still maintaining that he does not have the baby. 
Tanaya disappeared Saturday night. Her mother tells detectives she dropped the baby off at Michael Lewis's apartment, only to come back and find her gone. If you ask Lewis, Jones came back to pick the child up. Detectives do know the couple had a physical fight that night. Was Michael Lewis bruised? At this time, that's part of an ongoing investigation. I cannot comment on that. Was she bruised? Again, that's part of the ongoing investigation. During that physical alter altercation, are you concerned that something may have happened to that child? That's a possibility. Now, by the way, Michael Lewis could be the baby's biological father. We also just asked, asked detectives if Jones and Lewis would be taking polygraph tests. They would only answer that is part of their investigation. Back to you, Brendan. We hope this child is found safe and soon. Thank you, Serena. The Amber Alert was issued for Tanaya after Michael Lewis did not show up at the police station yesterday. A St. Petersburg father is recovering tonight after getting shot on the job. Thomas Powell was on his routine patrol as a security guard at Liberty Way in East Tampa when he was caught off guard by a gunman. The two struggled, then the gunman shot Powell several times. Powell managed to go to a nearby business for help. At first when I heard he was shot, I thought they might have killed him or something. But then she said that he's recovering, so it made me feel good. And tonight, Powell is listed in stable condition. A well-known Tampa Bay Buccaneer is facing some legal trouble. Cozy Coleman has been charged with domestic battery for an alleged attack on his girlfriend. ABC News reporter Rob Spicker joins us live at the Tampa Police Department. Rob, what happened here? Well, Brendan, according to the arrest affidavit, it involves a very angry Cozy Coleman slapping his live-in girlfriend on two separate occasions in just a very short time period yesterday afternoon. Just this afternoon, Cozy Coleman was released from jail, and shortly after that, he issued a statement that came out through the Buccaneers apologizing for any embarrassed he, embarrassment he might have caused to the Bucks, coaches, his teammates, and their fans. Cozy Coleman kept quiet, leaving the Orient Road Jail. I don't have any comment at this time. But his statement from the Bucks says he hopes to resolve the situation quickly. It happened here at this in-home daycare. Coleman and his girlfriend allegedly fighting over their eight-month-old son. Obviously, she no cuts, abrasions, obviously, and it's, it's a misdemeanor uh, offense, but uh, serious nonetheless. Coleman's arrest report describes two separate attacks. One slap when he was holding his eight-month-old son. The second one this way. He pushed, kicked, and slapped her and pulled her out of the car. Now that Coleman's out of jail, the judge has ordered that he stay away from his girlfriend, their baby, and a witness to the alleged abuse. He's also not to go anywhere near that daycare. As for his girlfriend, if she wants to see him again, she's got to go to court. Coleman's girlfriend apparently tried to run from the scene, but he chased after her, leaving altogether once the cops were called. Can you give us any reaction to what the police report says? Pushing, kicking, slapping? What about your baby boy? I really don't have anything to say. Now, Coleman turned himself into police several hours after the alleged attack there at the Orient Road Jail. TPD contacted the Bucks. They contacted him, made the arrangements for him to turn himself in. Right now, this does not appear it will have any impact on his playing time. A statement from Bucks General Manager Rich McKay says, until the legal system goes through all its courses, the team, the Bucks, will not comment about this. So presumably he'll be playing the next game. Thanks, Rob. Coleman was a second-round draft pick in the year 2000 from the University of Tennessee, and he's considered to be one of the Bucks' key offensive linemen. In tonight's Democracy in Action, it's a final face-off for Governor Jeb Bush and Bill McBride. The third and final debate between both gubernatorial candidates is tonight at 7 o'clock. And it's close. A new Mason-Dixon poll shows the Tampa lawyer is within five percentage points of the governor now. Both campaigns have begun a series of negative television ads, and the McBride camp says one ad is crossing the line. Take a look. How can McBride pay for all this spending? McBride says he'll raise your taxes. Will it be higher sales taxes? Higher property taxes? A new state income tax? The Action News Truth Squad reviewed the ad which suggests that McBride wants a state income tax. University of Tampa political scientist Scott Payne says it all boils down to mudslinging. That's just a cheap shot. That's what it is, a cheap shot? It's a cheap shot. It's not really being honest. It's not really going to his record. McBride says he has never proposed a state income tax. The Bush camp, meanwhile, defends the ad, saying Floridians deserve to know how McBride is going to pay for all of his promises. Well, stay right here. ABC Action News is coming right back. Police bust two men accused of hijacking a truck in Pasco County. Then after action weather...
The Devil Rays put their cards on the table to get Lou Pinella to come to Tampa Bay. ABC Action Sports shows us why it's going to be a while before we find out if Pinella actually takes the job. Big spending Bill McBride. Every day he promises more spending. The total so far? $29 billion. How can McBride pay for all this spending? McBride says he'll raise your taxes. Will it be higher sales taxes? Higher property taxes? A new state income tax? Tell the truth, Bill. How can you pay for it? One thing's for sure, $29 billion in new McBride spending means billions in new McBride taxes. Two men are in jail tonight, accused of hijacking two truckers at a Pasco County truck stop this morning. Angel Gutierrez and a passenger pulled over at the Flying J truck stop on I-75 and State Road 52 to fill up late last night. And that's when deputies say Fernando Solorzano and Luis Acosta shot Gutierrez in the leg and took off with the 18-wheeler with the passenger still inside. And it makes me scared because I'm a female, so it makes it even worse for me now, you know. Do I carry a gun or do I get registered or do I just stop driving? The men were arrested after someone called deputies to report a suspicious person in the Wesley Chapel area. Both suspects are charged with attempted murder, kidnapping and carjacking, while a third suspect is still on the loose. Attorneys for the Eisenbergs now want $7 million for defending the couple. Stephen Marlene Eisenberg and their attorneys qualified for the government payback when a judge dropped all the charges against the couple. They were accused of lying about their baby daughter's disappearance. She has been missing now for nearly five years. Now the defense team is trying to prove prosecutors fabricated evidence and that they deserve the extra money. And in this instance, uh, because the government uh, trampled on the constitutional rights of the Eisenbergs and, 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 and basically uh, the government was not truthful uh, with, uh, with what they said under oath, uh, the government will pay a price. In this case, taxpayers also pay the price. The U.S. Attorney's Office is pushing for a $1 million cap on the reimbursement. The judge will now decide how much the Eisenbergs and their attorneys should get. Action weather is next. Here's a live look at downtown Tampa from our action weather cam. Dennis has your forecast when we come back. ABC Action News. Not just a name, a new mission. Taking action for you. Investigations that get results. The Action News Investigators, led by Robin Guess. ABC Action News. Taking action for you. Karen Thurman's record on taxes will make you want to scream because Karen Thurman voted for the Clinton-Gore tax increase, the biggest tax increase in history. Just last year, she voted against the president's tax cut, which reduces the marriage penalty and eliminates the death tax. And Karen Thurman voted to raise taxes on the Social Security benefits that many seniors receive by 70%. Don't scream. Just call Karen Thurman. Tell her to stop before she taxes again. Tucker, Brendan McLaughlin, meteorologist Dennis Phillips, and Jay Crawford with sports taking action for you. Trust meteorologist Dennis Phillips and local action Doppler. 
Good evening, everybody. You look outside, it looks more like July and August. You see those cumulus clouds building, and you check out local action Doppler, and you see isolated afternoon and evening thunderstorms. The motion very slowly to the south. More showers than storms, but there have been a few lightning strikes here and there. And there they are over the last hour. Motion with this rain is down southward. A few heavier storms now trying to pop up over Hardy and DeSoto County. But I think generally speaking, over the next several days, it'll be more sunshine, more heat, more humidity, less regular fall weather. What we'd normally expect to see in late October, by the way, is lower 80s and lows in the 60s. Nowhere near that right through early November. It's going to be that long before we see another front here in the Bay Area. Right now, 85 degrees. Feels warmer than that when you factor in the humidity. Feels like 88. The winds are out of the west northwest. The pressure is falling. <laughs> the temperatures aren't falling. They're going up and they'll stay in the mid to upper 80s for the foreseeable future. Right now, mid 80s along the beach, mid to upper 80s across the interior counties. You look at this satellite picture. I mean, it literally looks like a sea breeze front kicking in like we get July and August. And really, just because we have temperatures up near 85, 90 degrees, that heat is all the energy you need for those isolated storms. Now you throw in a frontal boundary, and that leads to an even higher chance of rain. Thing is, that front will simply not make it here. It goes across the northern sections of the state, and when that happens, that means the drier air stays north of the frontal boundary. So that means anywhere from Georgia through the Carolinas, northern Mississippi, Alabama, they will be cooling off. For us, we stand a deep east to southeasterly flow for the foreseeable future. Now notice by later Friday, there's another front. And notice the winds. They're blowing parallel in the same direction as that front. The only way you're going to see this cooler, drier air come through is if you have a northerly wind pattern that will blow this frontal boundary through, allowing the dry air to get down here. It's simply not going to happen. And until it does, we stay moist and we stay very, very warm, about five degrees above normal. Here's the national picture. So you're looking for a little bit of winter out there. You don't have to look too far up north. Snow from the central plains through Iowa, up through the upper Midwest and in through the Great Lakes. And some of that snow pushing into New England. So at least a little bit of good news for the skiers from Vermont and New Hampshire. As these cooler temperatures work their way eastward, we stay well above normal at least until the middle of next week. And even farther than that, right now, no fronts are imminent. On the water, northeast winds 5 to 10 knots. Your Gulf temp, that's the only thing cooling down at 78 degrees. There are your tides. Sunrise 735, sunset 654, 7 and a half, your Ottawa UV index. There's a seven day. Highs upper 80s, morning lows, low 70s. Humidity, humidity will be high, while rain chances, comparatively speaking, will be kind of low. Guys? All right, thanks, Dennis. Al Keck joins us now. And it's kind of enticing to think that uh, Lou Pinella could be having temper tantrums and pulling third base out of uh, Tropicana Field. Yeah. Really make Tropicana Field expensive. a fun place. This just in, uh, there's talk that the Mariners will not allow the Mets permission to speak with Pinella oh. until talks or if talks breakdown between the Rays and Pinella, so that's even better so news. One wow. team at a time is the way they want to exactly, do it. Exactly, right? yeah. It's a big thing how they can control so much. Well, again, it's all about compensation because mm -hmm. Lou is still under contract to mm -hmm. Seattle. Baseball commish Bud Selig really knows how to spoil a party. The Devil Rays wanted to scream it to the world that they had made an offer to Lou Pinella, but Selig says no, not until the World Series is over. Now, there's still talk all around baseball. The Devil Rays have offered Pinella a four-year deal approaching $14 million. Right now, it's all up to Lou. The Devil Rays are the only team that has worked out compensation with the Mariners and given Lou an offer to manage. They want his fire. They want his ability to win. And while Rays officials cannot comment, several Rays talked about Lou while playing in a celebrity golf tournament at Feather Sound this afternoon. He's gonna make everyone accountable. I mean, it's not going to be, he doesn't care if he hurts feelings. You know, uh, he's the type of person, and, and that's just his personality. He's going to come at you. He's going to tell you what he expects of you, and he wants you to go out there and perform. He sees you as a Major League Baseball player. So if you're a Major League Baseball player, you're going to be able to do the things that he wants you to do, or he will get someone else in who can. But in order to bring Lou Pinella to Tropicana Field, some Devil Rays may be leaving the Trop because they could be part of that compensation to Seattle to make all this happen. Right now, it's a little bit difficult situation for, for everybody on the team. No, one's, no one really knows what's going on. No one really knows whose names are involved. But, um, you know, that's, that's the nature of this game. I mean, this game's a business, and uh, whatever happens, happens. But uh, I, I think Lou Pinella would be probably the perfect fit for this organization. 
And we'll have more at 11. Tonight's also Game 3 of the World Series. The Angels and Giants all tied at one win apiece. Tim Salmon with the big home run in Game 2. Ramon Ortiz will start for Anaheim. Levon Hernandez 6-0 in postseason play. We'll start for the Giants. All right, the Tampa Bay Lightning just keeps rolling. Nobody in the National Hockey League has a better record right now than the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Bolts own four wins at a tie after five games last night. New York falls to the uh, Lightning by a score of 4-2. The Lightning has three power play goals. Martin St. Louis has a pair of goals on the contest. And after five games, the Lightning leads the NHL with 24 goals. They off for the Buccaneers. They have been named seven-point favorites to beat Carolina Sunday in Carolina. Mm -hmm. Both teams will be down to backup quarterbacks because wow. of injuries. Yeah, well, That'll be interesting to watch. Uh, we could use a lift, that's for sure. All right, thanks, Al. We're going to be right back. Stay with us. ABC Action News. Not just a name. Our new mission, taking action for you. Breaking news, fast, accurate, complete. ABC Action News, taking action for you. I'm here with State Senator Kendrick Meek from Miami. He is also the chairman for the Coalition to Reduce Class Size and a proponent of Amendment 9. That's a constitutional amendment that would mandate reduced class sizes by the year 2010. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Senator, my first question is, uh, I'm going to ask you to address your opponents who claim that this amendment is so expensive that it's actually going to threaten services to the elderly, uh, higher education, the bright scholars, uh, uh, the Bright Future Scholarship Fund and other very popular services to pay for this. These are the very same people that have the state of Florida in a bad situation right now. We are last, dead last, as it relates to education investment here in this state. Um, the bottom line is it's interesting that they can, this administration can look over all of the special interest tax breaks that they've given to their friends um, like adult entertainment, um, sky boxes and sports stadiums. It's all about our priorities. Meanwhile, our children are sitting in classrooms competing with 39 other kids for the attention of the teacher. We've tried to do this in the state legislature. We've tried to do, do it through a joint resolution in the state legislature. And now a half a million Floridians got together and signed petitions to get this amendment on the ballot to reduce class size, to change, to be able to stand for our children here in the state of Florida. This would not cut programs. This is what they would do. And that's a question that is going to be a big part of this governor's race. Let's try to get a handle on the cost of this amendment. Now, over mm -hmm. eight years, between now and 2010, your estimate, as I recall, is, is $8 billion dollars. It, it's not our estimate, it's the Office of Economic and Demographic Research, which is the nonpartisan office in Tallahassee that sets the state okay. budget. By, by contrast, uh, the Education Secretary is putting it at $27 billion and maybe as high as $40 billion. Where's well, the truth here? Well, it's, well, the, the, well, that's a good question. Secretary Horn said it was $10 billion um, last year this time. I guess by the time of the election, it'll be $100 billion. The bottom line is, is that parents are very frustrated. That's why 70 plus percent of Floridians are agreeing with the class size amendment to make sure we stand for our children, make sure we phase in smaller class sizes, make sure we no longer have the political promises that we hear every election, with, that we have a political guarantee in the Constitution, making sure that local districts receive the dollars that they need to be able to reduce the class size. And that's Flor what this does. Florida already has a teacher shortage uh, of some severity here. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't this just worsen that situation and force the hiring of, of some maybe unqualified teachers? Well, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. If you look at the present um, uh, um, administration that we have now, they're giving vouchers and sending kids to unqualified schools that have unqualified teachers, uncertified teachers, I must add. Um, I know they're trying to do their best, but there are a lot of shivering teachers in the North that would love to come to Florida. And the reason why many of them are not coming, because we have a good package uh, economically, is that they don't want to be in an environment that they have to teach 40-some-odd kids. Leave alone those teachers that we have that we should try to retain. The working environment for our teachers here in the state 
of Florida is substandard. We're 50th in the nation as it relates to education investment, 49th in graduation rates. We have nothing to be proud of as it relates to our national standings, and it's important that we do investment now, and that's the reason why we put this uh, constitutional amendment on the ballot. Some would say that they would rather have their child in a larger classroom with an excellent teacher than a smaller classroom with a mediocre teacher. How do you know that reducing class size in and of itself is going to improve education? Studies have shown that test scores have gone up. Last year, 57,000 fourth graders failed the FCAT test. And let me just share this with you. Right now, we're the worst in the nation. We're the worst. Why do you think education is a key issue of this gubernatorial election? Because investment hasn't been made. And to even verify the point that we're in a bad situation, the governor comes out. As you know, he has devious plans against the class size amendment. That, that's a whole other issue and that voters are going to have to look at. But the bottom line is, is that he comes out with a plan saying 12,000 classrooms. But local districts are going to have to pay their fair share to get it. And this particular issue, um, that those dollars are going to come down from Tallahassee. We're going to have great teachers in the classroom because we're going to do it by 2010. This is not an overnight kind of thing, but it's important that we start now. The children that are in school now, the other side would have it, that you know, we, we could reduce the class size hopefully by the time they're on um, Medicare. But we cannot allow that to happen. And, and it's enough is enough. We can't continue to send our kids and having people that pay taxes every day sending their children to private school for a smaller class size because the state can't provide it. Some of the practical considerations worry some people and that, uh, for example, if you've got uh, a limit of 18 and you've got a 19th student that shows up, well, you got to provide another classroom for them, which might involve a portable, it might involve busing that child to another school across town. Well, see, all of these are scare, scare tactics from the other side. The real issue is that this is about funding. It's not about if it's 18 kids, you can't come in, number 19. That's not the case. It's about Tallahassee giving Hillsborough, Pinellas, and other surrounding counties and necessary dollars they need to reduce the class size. I mean, I've been in the state legislature for eight years, and I will tell you this, the folks that want their tax cut, and I do mean the special interest, not the middle class, because this real, Amendment 9 is about the middle class versus the special interest, and they're getting their, they're getting their fair share, and just the tax cuts for the last four years, $21 billion in special interest tax breaks over the time that it would take to reduce the class size. All right, Senator Kendrick Meek, uh, chairman of the Coalition to Reduce Class Sizes, thanks for being here Thank in you. Democracy in Action. Thank you. And looking ahead now to ABC Action News at 11 o'clock tonight, want to look younger without having to go under the knife? We'll show you a new technique that uses acupuncture to give your face a lift. That is tonight at 11. I'd like to look younger and go under the knife, whatever it takes. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like needles, all that sticking needles in your needles face. Needles in my it? head? Where needles, do you got to stick them? It's okay. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got there, Dennis? Still looking at some rain. Actually, a little more rain than we were looking at about 10, 15 minutes ago. Local action Doppler shows one little shower up near Plant City. A few more near Mayaka City over toward Gardner, Arcadia, primarily Hardy and DeSoto County with one heavier storm right near the A there in Action News in Highlands County. Lightning, yeah, there have been some lightning strikes. In fact, a few more, those two primarily in our southern counties, eastern Manatee, Sarasota. Motion is to the south. So you'll see a few lightning strikes down there in the southern sections of our viewing area. Otherwise, just another warm, another muggy night with no changes in the yeah, forecast. Not too much activity. Nope, another night in paradise. Thanks, Thanks Dennis, Dan. and thank you for joining us. World News Tonight is next. Our next newscast is at 11, and we hope to see you then. Bill McBride.